بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما آمين 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 برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Let us immediately jump into where we lift off We look tonight at engagement and looking at the opposite six آداب الخطبة وخطبة وأحكام النظر إلى غير محرم so there's some sunnas that we need to be aware of. It is recommended for a guardian to offer his marriageable female charges, meaning the, the girls who he is the wali of, in marriage to righteous men. This is sunnah. So for a father to actually take responsibility and actively look for a spouse uh, for his daughter. Now this may happen in a variety of ways, but the idea is not to get her married regardless of her readiness it is to be ready when she's ready right to be ready when she's ready so to actively look um, this way you have an, an active say in terms of your your child's future because if somebody comes and they proposes they are coming to they are coming to ask for what they want right they are in the they have the choice so when do you get the choice? Just in terms of who that person is, for you to get the choice, you have to go out and say, you know what, you have a son, they're around about the same age, maybe there's some interest there, that type of thing. Then, to intend by one's marriage to fulfill the sunnah and protect one's religion, this is also sunnah. Since one is only rewarded if one does a niyyah, that it is for some form of obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala such as remaining chaste or having pious children so what this teaches us is that even when it comes to nikah the idea of nikah comes from a different framework than in the western paradigm in the western paradigm it's a matter of my emotions my lust my fulfillment I fall in love with someone I live with that person and then I you know it's all about the self from the Islamic paradigm, the intention, if you want the nikah to be a blessed union of ibadah, then the intention is important. And the intention must be to remain chaste, to serve Allah, and, as uh, our author stated, to have pious children. That would be a positive intention. Obviously, then, you know, your own personal reasons are also there, but that's secondary. So the intention is always central. And it may seem inconsequential because it's a, it's a metaphysical thing. It's not something tangible that you can touch. But it's very consequential because it's the framework with which the bride and groom are going to enter into this union. Either they are going to enter from the perspective of we are doing this for Allah's sake and they're going to, they're going to lead their life a certain way accordingly. Or they are going to just do it for themselves. And then who knows how they're going to live their lives according to whose models, whose ethics. Then for the marriage contract to be made in a masjid, that is a sunnah. So try to keep the community events or communal events, try to keep it attached to the masjid. This is an important sunnah that has dire consequences when we start overlooking it. So the concept of having the nikah in the masjid, that's a beautiful thing. Don't ever take that away, away or outside of the masjid, right? When ilm, when ilm was taken away from the masjid, we lost something. We lost something in the transmission of ilm and in the, in the uh, ubiquitousness of ilm, right? It, it wasn't so prevalent anymore. It wasn't everywhere. And a lot of other things, but when it comes to nikah, and even if there's a khidbah, try to formalize it and have it at a masjid. It may seem like a good idea to have it at home, or in a hall, or some fancy place, but there's barakah 
in having it in the masjid. So that's a sunnah. And then, interestingly, for it to take place on Friday at the first of the day in the month of Shawwal. On Friday at the first of the day in the month of Shawwal. I attended an nikah that matched these criteria except for the first of the day part. Then, when it comes to the proposal, now in Western modern culture we have the we have a number of different stages, right? In a normal arrangement, you have the dating phase, then you have I don't know, there's a klum haram hutus that happens until eventually you get to the halal part. But even within our own tradition, we've got some ambiguities. If there's dating, there's absolutely nothing halal happening there, right? If there's a proposal, still it is as though they are strangers. So there's no, nothing becomes halal because there's a proposal and, ex and an acceptance, what we call an engagement. Nothing becomes halal because of the engagement. It's not like a try before you buy, period. It doesn't work that way. It's, it's just a promise. And it's a promise that comes with some, uh, with some rules and regulations as well, which we will look at immediately. But at this proposal, or before this proposal, leading up to it, you require some engagement. You require some physical interaction because you want to know, you know, how she looks, he wants to know, she wants to know, he looks. And this is halal, this is halal. But there are regulations about it. So the sunnah when one wants to marry a woman is to look at her face and hands. Okay, and then some fuqaha they add on some probable reasons why that is sunnah. Because the face indicates her beauty and the hands, uh, the robustness of body and the skin complexion and everything. But be that as it may, that's what you are allowed to look at. Imam Tirmidhi reports in his al jamia from al mughira that when he got engaged to a woman, the Prophet wasallam instructed him, look at her, for it is likelier to last between you. Right? You need to know that, that you like her. So, this, this description is a very odd one in our context. <laughs> because here the Prophet wasallam is like telling the person, look at her. In our context, by that point, you know, in modern culture, by that point, they would have seen a lot more than the face and hands of one another, which is unfortunate. So the Islamic way is, you go and find a bride, or you go and find a groom, a, a, a potential bride, a potential groom, I should say. And you ask questions, and you have meetings, and you look at one another, and you have conversation, and you decide, do I like this person? Well, I'm not quite sure one meeting wasn't enough. Let's meet again. Let's meet again. Let's meet again. Let's have, a, let's have several meetings. Family maybe gets together, um, etc. Interview style or casual style in whichever way, right? But the maximum engagement of looking at one another during that time period is face and hands, right, for the lady. And the point behind this, these meetings is to see whether they like each other and whether they want to uh, attempt a nikah, whether they want to get married. So if that is in place, then they proceed further with istikhara and the like. But let's look at the length and breadth of looking at her. Before getting engaged to her, even if the woman does not give permission to do so, so she doesn't say, look here, you can look at me, but you're going there with the intention of looking at her. So the rule that generally applies to you is lifted. What's the rule? The rule is you mustn't look at the opposite sex. We'll get to that. But you're not supposed to look at the opposite sex except when there's a need. And you're not supposed to look at them with desire at all. Here, that rule is lifted. Why is that rule lifted? Because the intention is nikah. What can you look at? You can look at the face and hands with the purpose of, do I have any desire for her? So that's the idea. Um, and of course, she's, she's giving consent to that because she's coming to the meeting. Otherwise, she doesn't have to come. So, such a person is entitled to repeat looking at her as many times as he wishes when he needs to make sure of how she looks and vice versa. So he does not come 
to have regrets after getting married, saying that, oh, no, I'm not happy with the way she, she looks. And then if there is something that he would like to know about her and see of her that he's not allowed to, for example, he wants to know, does she have long hair, does she have, you know, uh, is she plump, is she not plump? She want, he wants to know details. Here, the sunnah would be to send women from his family, whether it be his mother or his sister or his aunt, and they can go and have a more, quote-unquote, intimate interaction with uh, the lady and then come back and describe her uh, to him. Okay. But now we speak about that with such stringency, and it's odd in, again, I'm going to repeat this, it's odd in our society, because we interact with the opposite sex for the most part uh, in a very, very open way. But what are the limitations according to Allah's law? Right? Yes, we can argue this isn't prevalent in society, but it remains Allah's law. And it's important that we understand what the ideal is, and those are the ideals that we, we should, we're supposed to strive to live by. Right? Um, it may seem unrealistic, it may seem so, and it may seem impractical, but we don't water down the Sharia because of our own weaknesses. We, we remain you know, dedicated to the Sharia. Does the Sharia adapt according to circumstance to a degree? to a degree, right, certain things, but there's certain uh, parameters, non-negotiables, without which there's no such thing as Sharia, right? So, with regards to looking at members of the opposite sex, وَيَحْرُمُ أَيَّنْذُرَ الرَّجُلُ إِلَىٰ شَيْءٍ مِنَ الْأَجْنَبِيَّةِ It is haram for a man to look at any part of a marriageable woman, a woman that he is allowed to marry her. It's haram for him to look at her. So that's like news in case you didn't know. It's actually haram. If she's not his wife and if she's not his mahram, there being no difference in this between the face and hands or any other part. So even the face and hands. If it is uncovered. طيب? Though part excludes her voice. In the Shafi'i school, her voice is not awra. In the Shafi'i Madhab, the voice of the woman is not Aura, which obviously gives you a clue that in other Madhahib, the voice of a woman is Aura. But we're not going to delve into that right now. So you may think at this point, but this is unreasonable. How is it completely haram? Can't we just look, you know, when there's, when there's need? So that comes later. Obviously, when there's need, you may look. But this is the standard rule. Where does this come from? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah An-Nur, بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم كل المؤمنين يغضوا من أبصارهم ويحفظوا فروجهم and it says the same for the female counterpart say to the believing men they must lower their gaze they must guard their private parts and count this a hadith espouse this further and give it further detail right support it and give it further detail so a majority of scholars, with the exception of some Hanafis, have been, recorded as be, have been recorded as holding that it is unlawful for women to leave the house with faces unveiled. Now, yeah, I'm going to deviate from what the author said. I've read this thoroughly. I've written on this already from this particular book. Um, the, the fact of the matter is, when it comes to the face and hands being covered, right? We were speaking about looking at now we're talking about being covered. Uh, in other words, the wearing of a niqab. So, there are two positions and only two positions that exist within sacred law across the board from the madhahib. Those two positions are, one, that it is sunnah, and two, that it is wajib. Right? Those are the only two positions. Now, why am I opening up with this statement? I'm opening up with a statement because that would be the parameters of where we can differ. طيب? Outside of that, you don't find uh, traditional scholars across the board, any of them, saying that it is outside of Islamic practice, or it is cultural, or it is um, a non-issue. Like they don't say like it's not sunnah. They don't say it's haram or makru. They either say it is sunnah, or they say it is obligatory. There's consensus across the board that if, they, if there is fitna, now the definition of what fitna is, the scholars differ on to what extent is fitna. Fitna means trouble. Um, I believe the correct opinion in that regard is that fitna 
is when there's a specific case of danger for one lady, that's fitna. So when there's fitna, there is consensus that it is wajib. Right? If there's danger of assault, there's consensus that it, it becomes wajib. So that's interesting. Ijma. After that, if there's no fitna, some scholars say wajib. This ikhtilaf exists till this day and it stretches up all the way to the Sahaba of Rasulullah Sallallahu and it comes from the Quran and Ahadith because the evidence isn't very clear, you know, uh, abundantly clear on this issue. So they differ. Some say it is wajib. That is not the opinion of the majority of the ulama, of the four madhahib. So the preponderant view of the Maliki, Hanbali, and Hanafi schools is that it is not wajib, it is sunnah. That's the preponderant view. Within the madhahib, there may be differences of opinion, but that's the preponderant view. Interestingly, the Shafi'i madhab, the Shafi'i madhab has two official views, right? By two of the leading scholars of the latter uh, scholars of the madhab, Imam Ibn Hajar al Haytami and Shamsuddin al Ramli. And they differ on the matter as well. So the ikhtilaf extends until, you know, basically the, the modern era. So what happens in the case of that? In the case of there being ikhtilaf, there's leeway both ways. It's up to the mufti of a particular domain to decide which fatwa he's going to give. So you find in places like Yemen, for example, everyone wears uh, the niqab following the Shafi'i madhab, right? But that particular view. So there's, there's leeway. But this is an important discussion, not because I'm saying, oh, women must go into niqab. I don't, I don't believe that to be the case. I believe there to be uh, you know, leeway in, in the Sharia. My point in going into detail in the, in the discussion is so that academically you can see that the idea, the notion that this thing is foreign to Islam is absurd. There's this notion that the niqab is something that was uh, practiced among earlier cultures, traditions, such as the Persian Empire and the cultures and traditions. And that may or may not be true, but that, that is not enough to support the view that, that it's foreign to Islam. Many things were adopted from earlier cultures. The wearing of the turban, the growing of the beard, the wearing of these long robes, dresses, whatever you want to call it, thobes. Right? It doesn't mean that it's foreign to Islam. It was adopted into Islam and it has virtue in and of itself. Then the matter extends further. They were the wives of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and for them it was wajib to be completely veiled. Right? Um, Naam. So that is in relation to the face veil. Uh, my personal view is I believe that the face veil depends on the context. I believe, this is just my, my it doesn't, there's no value to what I'm saying whatsoever, so just don't listen to me, that's fine. But I believe that it depends on the context. So I, in a minority situation, it may not be the wisest thing, because the purpose is to not attract attention. So if it attracts more attention, then it may not be the wisest thing. In other contexts, where there is no such notion, so it's not going to be, uh, you know, it's not going to be a draw card. It's like a norm in society. Then I think it's the safer thing to do, um, you know, considering the way the world is going right now. So that, those are my views, but there's, there's no uh, weight to that whatsoever. Allah knows best. Taib. Being alone with a woman who is not one's wife or unmarriageable kin is always unlawful. Though if there are two women and a man, for example, right, the man and the woman are no longer considered alone, right? So being alone with a, with a marriageable woman that is not your wife or your mahram, so marriageable, is absolutely haram. But if there are two women and one man, then they are no longer considered alone. Furthermore, now it gets like a tantalizing. A man may look at his wife and vice versa, including her nakedness, from top to bottom. But it is offensive for either to stare at each other's genitals. But this point, 
this point, uh, it's not, not everyone agrees upon this. Some scholars would say, no, 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 absolutely look. You know, <laughs> it makes sense. Look, don't look elsewhere. <laughs> don't ever look elsewhere. You say, look here. Anyway, but that's, that's, uh, that's the modesty within the, the sacred law as well. Offensive isn't haram, right? Also, offensive and haram is not the same thing. So even if you go upon this view, offensive is still not haram. I personally don't think you should consider it to be offensive, considering our circumstances. Um, if you have access to look at naked women by the millions, probably, I don't know, you know? So make halal easy and make it light and make it more accessible for people when haram becomes prevalent. That's a darura, it's a necessity. And, and we as a community need to remember that in every aspect of our lives. So if you, if, we, if you feel that for your kids, for example, haram is easily accessible, then your job is to make halal more easily accessible. Allah knows best. A man may look at his unmarriageable female relatives and a woman may look at her unmarriageable female relatives viewing any part of the body that shows while they are working casually at home except what is between the navel and the knees that can never be shown. That may come as a bit of a shocker because we're saying that a man may look at his unmarriageable relatives. So for example, his daughter, his sister, you know, but not what is in between the navel and the knee. So that may sound like a lot that you can see. But then you think of a context such as breastfeeding, right? That you can now understand that that is allowed, you know, in this, uh, in this particular context. As for a woman looking at other than her husband or unmarriageable male relatives, it is unlawful just as a man's looking at her is unlawful. So the idea that a man's aura is that which is in between the navel and the knees is one thing. That's what he must cover. But what she mustn't look at is everything <laughs> except the hands and the face. Ajeeb. Right? So it's not okay to ogle a man's six pack on a movie, for example. It's not okay. You may think, no, it's fine because that's not in between the navel and the knees. <laughs> Right? Naam. So, in relation to that, it is unlawful for a woman to show any part of her body to an adolescent boy or a non Muslim woman, but I'm going to comment on this in a moment, unless the latter is her kinswoman, meaning slave. We don't have slavery any longer, in which case it is permissible. So, in Murunil al Muhtaj, uh, Khatib Shirbini limits it to, to this, right? But other scholars in the madhab, um, several of them, much more, uh, I think, much more contemporary than Khatib Shirbini, commentators of the uh, Umdat Salik that I have before me here, they mentioned that no, for non Muslim women, they can, they can be less covered because according to this ruling here, a woman can't show her body at all, except the face and her hands, to a non-Muslim woman, right? So you think about a situation like a domestic worker, for example. According to this ruling, as it is in this book, that would mean uh, she must always wear a scarf, for example. But the other scholars have not, uh, they've not agreed to this limitation. They've extended it to say, you can, right? Okay, there's a few more that I need to run through. It is not permissible for a man to look at a woman who is not his wife or unmarriageable relatives except for her face and hands because of the necessity of her need to deal with men in giving and taking and the like. If a man is not safe from lust, he may not, he may not look at her face except when it is demanded by necessity. So these are the situations in which it, it becomes permissible. A man may look at the whole body of another man except what is between the navel and the knees. Ha! This is important. Men seem to think there's no aura between themselves and other men, which is a weird thing. 
It's a very weird thing. P.S. Do not go to the gym's bathrooms ever. There's no sense of aura there. Oh, I don't know. I've heard growing up many boys and men speak about, ah, we all have the same thing. That, that's not how it works. Your aura is between your navel and your knees. Right? Even in front of other men. Um, including the knees, as the knees are considered nakedness according to the Hanafis, but not by the Shafi'is. So that's just the precaution. A woman may look at the parts of a man uh, that another man is permitted to look at. Okay? A woman may look at the parts of another woman that a man is permitted to look at of another man. So we've explained that already. Whenever looking is unlawful, so is touching. In case anybody was thinking, okay, can I cake? Can I fat? <laughs> no. Uh, whenever, meaning the part, whatever is unlawful to look at is also unlawful to touch. And any permissible looking that leads to temptation is unlawful. So in other words, if a man looks at another man and has desire, what must he do? He must look away. He must look away. Why? Because there's temptation. There's fitna. So he must look away. Sounds weird. He's lowering his gaze. Get the pun? Play on words. Sue me. But he must lower his gaze. Why? Because there's fear of temptation. The Sharia, in relation to that, the Sharia doesn't deny the existence of these things. And that's, that's what people need to get clear. The Sharia doesn't deny the existence of these things. There are rules. There are rules. Sometimes the rules are dealt with in, in, in Masail that's specifically mentioning Khuntha, which is hermaphrodite technically. But that's such a rare occasion. I believe it extends further than that. Allah knows best. Uh, don't take my ijtihad too seriously there. But there are rules. And the rules apply. So you can't get married. A man can't get married to, for example, a, a non-Muslim woman. Now some people are going to think, but the Quran then says, true. The Quran does say that a man may marry Ahlul Kitab. The Quran does mention that. But the Shafi'i Madhab has a very specific understanding of who they are. And the Ahlul Kitab, according to the Shafi'i Madhab, are those whose ancestors followed the sacred scriptures before the religions got changed. They must be able to trace the, the Islam, the submission to that religion, to all the way there. If they cannot, they are not considered Ahlul Kitab. They are considered people who join the religion after it deviated. That's a very, very narrow uh, selection. If I'm not mistaken, there's only like one branch of, of you know, original Jews, so to speak. Um, I, I'm speaking completely out of my domain of comfort there, but so that's the ruling in the Shafi'i Madhab. So he's not allowed to marry. But now what if he's attracted to a non-Muslim woman? Let's say she's not even Ahlul Kitab. She's an atheist. What must he do? So he's really attracted to her. He really wants to sleep with her. So he must, what must he do? Who knows? He must either get her to embrace Islam or he must make sober. Understand? Okay, what about a man who is extremely sexually active? Extremely. Like, very extremely. He's got four wives. Still not enough. He wants more. I know it's funny, but yeah, hypothetically speaking. So he really he needs more. He's, he's like losing his mind. What must he do? He must make sober. He must make sober. What if another man or woman, she's deeply desirous 
of goat. Of goat. What must they do? <laughs> Good one. No, she mustn't name somebody by the name of Billy. She must make sober. What she does with her emotions and her feelings, uh, that's what matters. Having them, that's a different discussion. You feel something haram. You feel within yourself something haram. Islamic law is not going to bend because you feel that way and that must cater for you. No, you must bend in the metaphorical sense and not uh, give in to it. That's it. Khalas. There's no further discussion. Uh, but there's no need for further discussion, right? In that sense. It's just not permissible. It's not going to ever be permissible. So you must make sabr. And then a woman may look at the... Oh, I said that already. Uh, then... Okay. Doctors treating patients of the opposite sex. Right? أحكام المعالجة معالجة الرجل بالمرأة or vice versa. So both looking and touching are permissible for medicinal purposes. I'm not going to go into the list. It speaks about bloodletting, cupping, medical treatment, etc. When there's a need. Um, a Muslim woman needs medical attention must be treated by a Muslim woman doctor. If there is none, then by a non-Muslim woman doctor. And if there is none, then by a Muslim male doctor. And if there is none, then by a non-Muslim male doctor. That tartib is considered wajib. It must be followed. And I don't think that we have a choice because we, we spoiled for choice when it comes, alhamdulillah, for Muslim doctors, right? We are spoiled for choice. Um, and that's unfortunate. I mean, if your if your if your uh, home doctor, so to speak, for many many years happens to be a man, and you're a Muslim woman, sorry, again, <laughs> the Sharia is not going to bend to to suit your circumstances. I, I know I'm sounding harsh, but I'm just tired of hearing about all this LGBTQ stuff. It's just it's just tiring. I don't even see the fuss. For me, it's like crystal clear. Don't expect me to accept it in, the, in Allah's law. That's it. Finished. Um, nah. So you got the tartib. The same thing applies to a man. So a man must go to a Muslim man. And if he cannot, then to a Muslim female. And if he cannot, then to a, a non-Muslim female. So he has to, by necessity, go through that uh, sequence. Yes. Ah, yes. Excuse me. So, the same rule applies to Muslim men with regard to having a doctor of the same sex and religion. The same sex takes precedence over the same religion. The same sex takes precedence over the same religion. So, Muslim male must go to a Muslim male or a non-Muslim male. Then, a Muslim female. Yes. Necessary treatment of the face and hands permits looking at uh, each other. Okay? Looking at either the, sorry, not each other, at either the face or the hands. As for other parts of the body, the criterion for permissibility is the severity of the need for the treatment, meaning that there must be an ailment as severe as those permitting dry ablution, and if the part concerned is the genitals, the need must be even more acute, though it includes gynecological examinations for women with fertility problems which are permissible. So, even though it becomes permissible, right, it's only, here's the rule, الضرورات تبيح المحذورات Necessities make the impermissible permissible. But the second part is equally important. الضرورات تقدر بقدرها Necessities are measured to the extent that they are required. You with me? After that you must abstain. So if a lady's got the aina here, 
then only you must be exposed. That's basically what it comes down to. If a man needs to expose himself in front of a non-Muslim doctor, then he can, but only to the extent that's permissible. So say for example, uh, if you go through private, you can ask. But if you go through public, then you don't always get to ask about who the doctor is going to be. Trust me, I know. We've been through fertility stuff uh, recently with Grotesky Hospital. So you don't get the choice. So you can, as the lady, you can have like long socks, very long socks, because you must cover your leg. Even though you must expose, you know, your, 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 the main part of your aura must be exposed, right? You must still cover as much as you, as, as you can. That's always the, the precaution. And if a doctor asks you to undress, um, then the doctor needs to explain why, you know, you can't wear your clothing. Let's say, for example, it's just a normal examination. Why can't it be over the clothes? So either the doctor is going to agree that, no, it can be over the clothes, or the doctor is going to say, this is the reason why. But those are the limitations. A permissible looking at marriageable member of the opposite sex. Looking at a woman is permissible for testimony in court, for commercial dealings, so to work, to commerce, you know, buy and sell, it's permissible. Um, Non-commercial dealings, as when he wishes to marry her, right, and so forth. Obligatory or recommended learning. Obligatory or recommended learning, then it's permissible, to the degree required. It is not permissible to exceed the degree required, as when looking at part of the face is sufficient, in which case looking at the rest of it is not permissible, as it exceeds the amount required. So this is even in terms of the choice of school. Now look at, if you must really follow this to the, lit, to the letter, then you're going to consider this in terms of your selection of schooling, or where your child goes to school. Now even if you don't follow it to that extent, I think it's important that parents uh, make decisions according to, are the teachers good people? Are they good Muslims? You know, things like that. Uh, if they are Muslims, do they obey the laws of Allah? as Muslim teachers, right? Mathalan, it's not always apparent, but you, certain, certain things are apparent. So if they apparently disobey the laws of Allah, then you should consider those things. But furthermore, a girl should ideally be learning from girls, from ladies, and a man the same, ideally, according to sacred law. Is it always going to be practical? No, but now you know that that's the ideal. Okay. okay. Any questions on uh, any of this so far? I'm a bit sick, I don't know if you can hear, but there's a flu coming on, so forgive me for my uh, grogginess. No question, that's very funny, yes? Basically, yes. Between men and men, the aura is, <coughs> excuse me, from the navel to the knee. And the same thing between women and women, right? Not based on the preponderant view that I mentioned earlier on, but the other scholars, also between uh, navel and knee. But one should always, in these matters, gauge the, uh, the circumstance, right? Um, yes, a man's aura is between his navel and his knee. But because of the way the world is now, I wouldn't be too comfortable not having a, a, a top on in front of other men that I don't know. So if I go swimming, I'll wear, what do you call it? A rash vest. Besides my three-quarter bather, I'll also wear a rash vest. Unless I, I know that it's only family around and things like that, uh, then things are different. Now, I'm not saying it's compulsory. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying it's a consideration. Um, sportsmen, that's another biggie, right? Unfortunately, the trend is short. And um, look, I haven't researched this myself, but my late teacher, Mufti Taha, Rahimullah, Mullah Wasif, I don't know if you, if you research this, but the Maliki school, people quote the Maliki school saying that the Maliki school says, so attain, right? The front and back private parts. That is aura. But Mawlana 
taught, and I, I just need to verify this, that that is for salah. That's for salah. That's not in front of other people. They, they also say navel in the knees. Malina, did you, did you check this one up already? No. So, uh, yeah. Cover my. It's not so bad. You're not going to get any faster. Like, like, give me an example. If your work activity is related to looking at people, to what extent? Oh. Um, mm. Yeah, no, then it's absolutely permissible. I mean, this is part. We said we gave a list of, of necessary things. Yeah, uh, let me just read it again. I can't find it, but commercial dealings, non-commercial dealings, work, uh, security, those are all things that are included as far as, here we go, testimony in court, um, obligatory recommended learning, that w would be regarded as permissible. But now look here, where does this leave movies? Da -na -na -na. <laughs> No, 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 no. Um, for some scholars, they, they, they regard that type of looking at women, like normal face, hair, that type of thing. They, they actually lean it enough to say, look, it's overlooked. You're not looking at that. Da, 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 da. But for movies, no. I don't think anybody's going to bend over that because there's too many factors, you know, to give a blanket ruling. It's, it depends on the content. That's all I can say. If the content shows haram and you're looking at it, that's haram. If the content doesn't show haram things and you're looking at it, then it's not haram. It's not monolithic. Depends on what it is. But people's regulations over themselves about what is and is not, and is not okay is problematic. Because people are going to only look at things like sex, drugs, violence, uh, what you call swearing, profanity. They're only going to look at that. But there's more to it than that uh, from a shara'i perspective. Right? There's, okay, depending on your view of music, there's that. Uh, there's the storyline. Is it promoting haram in any way? And today, what movie isn't? Um, yeah. So if you can avoid all of that and still manage to watch a mainstream movie, right? So that's, that's why I said at the beginning of this, I think last week I said, like, we are, we're very far from this reality. But it's not impossible, and um, there are many people who, who live according to those standards. Um, it's not as strict as it seems. It's not as, as uh, stringent as it seems, right? Don't look at anything haram with desire. Any other questions? Let me just check, because last week I neglected the... Is massage therapy and linotherapy permissible? Depends. Depends on the requirement. Um, if it's something, I don't know what linotherapy is. But if it's massage therapy that is required, so then it can be considered medical. If it's purely for uh, relaxation, <coughs> then um, the parameters will, will need to be followed. And the parameters were that L the same rules for looking apply to touching and then of course you need to consider religi re religious compatibility is it a muslim or non-muslim so ideally if you are going to have anything of that nature done it would need to be a muslim woman for a muslim because it was asking the question a muslim woman it, need, it would need to remain within the area outside of between the navel and the knees so but it's not exactly going to be the best practice type of thing. Allah knows best. Type. Um, the next discussion is uh, going to be about the rulings, the rulings related to proposing for marriage.
who you can propose to, who you can't propose to, the Idda period, how that affects it, um, what happens after the proposal, does she owe you, you know, anything? I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to your questions now in a moment. I just want to sort of give you an idea. And then after that, Arkanun Nikah, the integrals of a marriage contract. So that's when you really get into the, the meat and bones of, of what makes up the Nikah. But just back to the whole can a Muslim marry a non-Muslim thing. Locally, our scholars here have never opened up that door. Traditional, like all the traditional scholars. Even up until this day, if you go to the MJC and you say, I want to marry a, a, a Yahudi or a Nasrani, I don't believe anybody's going to put through the nikah from that fraternity. There are individuals who do so in the individual capacity, but it's a door that is wisely left closed. And, and the result of it is very apparent within our community. Because scholars haven't opened that up, it's like a known thing. Even there was a mock lottery thing, what you call it, comedy, right? And one of the things that he said in there was, you know, um, you must know if, if you get married to a Muslim, they expect you to turn. It's like a funny thing. But it's true. <laughs> it's just, it just is true. If you, you must become Muslim for him if you, want to, if you want to marry him. So that may not be the best situation of embracing Islam, but some of, the, some of those people who embraced Islam under those circumstances have become phenomenal Muslims. Right? That's one. And the other is that we don't have families, entire families who have lost the Iman because of that type of intermarriage, as is the case in other Muslim minorities in the world. Many in South America, for example. Where Muslims got the first generation, they said, okay, you can, not, you can marry Ahlul Kitab. Sometimes they remain Ahlul Kitab, sometimes they even go outside of Ahlul Kitab. The children, some children is, you know, Muhammad and other children is Kimberly, you know, that type of thing. They don't even know their Shahada one generation later. Like, Ashadu ala ilaha, they don't know those words. So whilst academically, you may come and argue that the Sharia allows for this type of interreligious marriage, the restriction in the Shafi'i Madhab I believe to be the safer in terms of the preservation of the Sharia ah and in terms of the preservation of the community. That restriction should be observed and Allah knows best. It's a bad time when the child doesn't know they celebrate Christmas, they celebrate La Baran. There are Muslim kids, five years, six years of age. If you ask them, who's Jesus? I promise you, you'll find some of them saying he's the son of God. They don't know. They just repeat what they hear. I heard this in my own ears. So it's a door that I wouldn't open. And I mean, I've been asked. You get asked all sorts of cases like that. Just outright refuse. So I won't do that. Uh, what happens in the matter of a man wearing cycling shorts? Sister, that's so directly on the point. I almost mentioned it in a very ambiguous way. There's no way that I can say it's halal. <clears throat> There's no way I can say it's halal. <coughs> yes, you may. No. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, what is it? I don't know what that is. I'm joking. Uh, is it tennis? I, I, w I would say no, but I'm sure there's a way that somebody can imagine it being permissible. But if it means that by necessity you're going to look at the lady's aura, then no, it's not. It's not. <laughs> when I wumble the ladies' final, can I watch it? <laughs> Yes, yes, that's the next thing. That's the next thing, the engagement. Um, the rules for proposing a marriage or accepting a bro. It is unlawful to propose marriage openly or elusively to another's wife when she is in the waiting period of an unfinalized divorce. So if a lady is in a idda, you can't propose marriage, uh, whether that be an idda of wafat, 
her husband has passed away or she's in the idda of a talaq. A woman who is in any of the following types of waiting period, it is unlawful for a suitor to propose openly to her, though not for him to hint at it. <laughs> he can hoist come in these situations. The waiting period of a finalized threefold divorce. So they can't propose, but they can hint. What is that like? Send a get well soon card with a bunch of roses. He's not proposing, but it is, it's hinting. Oh, no, 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 no. He can't explicitly say anything about marriage. Uh, you know, from him to her. He can give her a gift. He can say, you know what? Many men would be lucky to end up with a woman like you. You would not have nothing to worry about. Something like that. That's hint. Um, okay, texting. Texting. I believe a man and a woman texting privately is as good as them being alone. I believe that, sincerely, because this, everything is possible except actual penetration in that situation. It's possible. It's an open door. It's a private room. Nobody knows what you're doing. Nobody knows what you're saying. I believe it should be treated as such, that if a girl wants to chat to a boy uh, just like randomly, like friends, I don't think that she, uh, she should do that. Family. Um, that type of thing, social, if you're in a group and they're you know, chatting like that, again, that's not being alone. These are just doors, ambiguous doors, that ihtiyatan, right, as a precautionary, I'm saying I believe. There's a difference between me saying I believe and saying that shara'an, it is not allowed. Um, it, it's just a precautionary thing. Because for me, knowing what you can do online and what's possible online, and the reason why uh, these laws exist in the first place, there's a corollary there. Rather, rather not allow it. Okay, does it sound too restrictive? I'm not saying she can't have a phone. I'm not saying, you know, he can't have a phone. But they mustn't be chatting like one on one alone. Um, I believe that to be problematic. Right? It's, it's, it's whatever you can do in dating, you can do in there. Um, now, and then. So it is also haram for her to accept a marriage proposal if she is in those situations. It is unlawful to propose marriage to a woman to whom another has already done so. So if there's a lady, somebody proposed to her, you can't go and propose on top of that proposal. Okay? If the first proposal has been openly accepted. If somebody proposed and she didn't give that person an answer, then you can go and propose. But if somebody's proposed and it was accepted, then you're not allowed to. Then... Unless the first suitor gives his permission, by the way. That's, a, that's an interesting situation. The first suitor says, look, okay, you can try. <laughs> you can try. I don't know. But if he gives the permission, then it's okay. Whoever is asked about what kind of person a prospective groom is should truthfully mention his failings. <laughs> if somebody asks you, look here, you know that Malina Irshad guy? He came and he, oh, yeah, I'm not going to use myself as an example. <laughs> Um, you know, that's this other guy. He came and he proposed to my daughter. I want to know, um, what do you know about him? You can't be like, oh, no, uh, he's a good guy, Marshall. If you know something, you have to say it. It's your duty. So that's why I said a few weeks ago, I said, Google the guy. Google her. It's the same like asking about other people. This is a, is a unique situation. So you must say. Um, to protect the person who is asking, as Imam Nawawi stated in, um, in his Kitab al-Adhkar, is not allowed. Uh, sorry, I said that wrong. To protect the person who is asking, in other words, this wali, you must, you must by necessity uh, reveal it and concealing it is not allowed. Then, at the proposal itself, now this is what we refer to as the engagement. It is sunnah to give a short khutbah when making the marriage proposal. And this is the same as the, the khutbah in Jumu'ah, the, the same arkan and shurut. So you will hear tahmeed, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. There will be wasiyah bi taqwa, there will be reading of an ayah, etc. It's the same format as the Jumu'ah khutbah. So that's sunnah. 
to be recited before the proposal. Not just before the nikah, before the proposal. So that would be the, the engagement. And that is the engagement. That's the, the end of the engagement. You can be as brief as, okay, this, they give you the arkan. It is also recommended to give another brief address, khutbah, at the marriage contract. So this is absent in our tradition. I don't know. Did you ever go to an, uh, an engagement with this uh, khutbah? One and a? I think we did that one, isn't it? That was, that was an engagement, that family of yours. That was an engagement, yeah. That was, I think, the only one I ever did that I was, you know, part of. So that's a sunnah. So that's the engagement, and that's the end of the story. There's no exchange of rings and things that forms part of the sharia, or gift, or anything. That's all cultural. Not a problem, it's fine, but it's cultural. What is a problem is if he has to put that ring on her finger. Why? Because he's not allowed to touch her. You understand? That would become problematic. Um, or anything of, of a similar nature. Uh, photography with them together, this, that, and the other. There's nothing that, okay, they engage now. Allah is must now engage. So now they can go to the bioscope or whatever. No, <laughs> they can't. It's the exact same as before the engagement. The only difference is there's now rules with regards to the proposal. She now can't accept another person's proposal, or rather another person can't come and propose. They just promised one another that they'll be getting married. So ideally in the Islamic, par in the Islamic paradigm, there shouldn't be definitely no dating, but there, sh there would nat naturally be a time of getting to know one another. Call it a month, call it two months, call it three months, where they are having meetings, making istikhara, <coughs> asking questions. By the way, the questions, I would advise every wali to start collecting a list of questions. So if you have daughters, start putting together the questions, even if it's in your mind, that your daughter should ask. If not you, then your daughter. And some of those questions need to be explicit. Some of them need to be explicit. Because you need to know that level of detail. I'm not saying that's the first meeting. I'm saying somewhere along the line of development, before the final yes is given, there needs to be a conversation about even things related to the, to the bedroom. I think it's a valid question to ask if somebody has any uh, previous sexual uh, um, experience. And if they did, and you forgive that, then if there's any STDs, that's a question, right? Um, that they must reveal. If there's any defects in that regard that they know of, right? Um, and then also if they have any abnormal sexual expectations, and then you can define what is normal. I'm not saying that this must be done at the beginning or even in the middle. I'm saying somewhere along the line when it is safe, it's a conversation that must take place because it's important, right? And then there's some things that people just don't think about. But that's why I'm saying start compiling your list of questions now. For example, what's going to happen to your parents when they retire one day, are we going to look after them? Is that an agreement we're going to go into? What's going to happen if, um, whatever, certain circumstances that life would probably throw at you at some point in the future? It would be good to know, so that is not, you get there and it's like, surprise, surprise, I expect this. How many times a week do you expect the wife to make the food, or you going to make the food, or how are you going to divide chores up in the household? That's an important question, right? How do you expect? So those things need to be asked, but again, that's why there's this proposal. So you can go and propose, and this doesn't mean you must get married, it just means that you are now going to be getting married sometime, hopefully soon. And then you can meet, you can ask. Um, there's no limitation on the time, but obviously, Islam wants Ya ma'ashar al-shabab Man istata'a minkum ul-ba'a Fal yatazawwaj So that the normal overall ruling is that young people should get married The specific rulings we dealt with Earlier on in the, in the course Like you know, your specific circumstances Taib, any questions uh, Specifically about the engagement That Kunadi wants to know um, That the awliya I would say to a degree, yes, that, uh, that the male, 
the male doesn't need to send anyone. He doesn't need to. But I think it's a beautiful tradition because he's sending his only eyes, you know, uncles and father and so on. I think it's fine. Uh, I don't think there's any intrinsic problem with the traditional practices except the ones that I mentioned. Um, like the ring, putting the ring on and now them holding hands or touching in photographs and things like as though they are partly halal, those things are problematic. And then of course if there's exposure of aura and all of those other things. The idea is you're starting your life, you want barakah in there, don't do the stuff that's going to take the barakah out. I, I, I can't understand that if a married couple wants blessings in their marriage, you don't start off that day, the, the day of the wedding, by not making salah on time. How is your marriage, I don't know, Allah knows best, right? How is your marriage going to be blessed if the day you got into the, that union, claim on gardens or whatever the case may be. So, you know, Allah forgive us for any past mistakes, but these are things we need to be conscious of. These are the reasons for sacred law. They are there to bring the barakah, the blessings, the goodness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I always have to reiterate this point. I don't know why. It should be obvious. But following these laws will not guarantee uh, what we consider positive results here in this world. You with me? Like people think, oh, so then there's definitely going to be no divorce, Malana. No, that's not what it's saying. You can still end up in a divorce. What it's going to guarantee is the pleasure of your Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what it's going to guarantee. So, but that said, I only know uh, goodness that, that has come of this type of union. It's, I know of cases, a few cases where it didn't work out, but that's with all marriages. Statistics, however, doesn't, doesn't have anything good to say about the standard procedure of dating. Nothing at all. Highest level of divorces and the standard, the standard procedure is uh, dating, right? In light of, you must remember when I say dating, we've already defined what that is, no? The, the idea of having a boyfriend and a girlfriend and you steady and then you have a different boyfriend and a girlfriend and you steady and that idea, that's haram. But the idea of a boy and a girl meeting under supervised conditions, um, according to the rules of the Sharia, if you call that courting or dating and whatever the case may be, that's necessary, that must happen. That has to happen for the nikah to uh, take place. Any last questions? Or question, I'll give you one, Bismillah. I think it's a, it's a good thing. It's not a necessary thing, but I think it's a very good thing. Um, the, reason, the reason I say so, and I, I actually want, Malna Wasif, if, if you don't mind, I want you, you also to comment on the question. But, um, the reason I say it's a good thing is, it's a contract, and yes, the contract starts with the wali of the bride, but it immediately evolves over to, over to her. So now it's a contract with her, and she should be a witness to that contract, ideally. Um, there would be no reason for her not to be there. Uh, so I think it should become a standard practice. I I'm glad to see that it is kind of becoming a standard practice, because normally, Back in the day, like when the man is busy doing that, she's busy with her makeup there, whatever. Like you're literally being given off in marriage right now, and you're worried about the shade of red on your cheeks. Not that that's not important, Maaf, ladies. Molina, your perspective? Molina, as if my uh, good friend and colleague. They can't hear you then. <laughs> okay, Bismillah. Hold on.
sure there's always funny moments in that man. Subhanallah. I saw some weird stuff, but let's not go down that route. Jazakumullah khairan. Um, I don't see any further questions on the stream either. So we'll conclude on that note. Um, I'll be leaving, as I said, on the, four, the 17th of July. Mulla Wasif will be taking over from me. For that time, I'm going to Turkey for some studies, make dua. I hope to benefit uh, some of the senior scholars who are teaching me. Well, no, one of them is uh, Dr. Muhammad Hassan Itu, the author of uh, Wajiz. So uh, he, he wrote one of the, a few of the books that we studied, actually. So that's, uh, and I mean, there are a few scholars. And it's the first time in a long time that I get to go be a student, like just a student. So make dua. Um, and we will continue from this point next week where we start discussing the arkan of the nikah, right? The arkan of the nikah. Very important, very interesting. We can look at that and the differences of opinion in the madahi play a huge role there actually. Khair wa sallallahu ala sallina Muhammad subhanallah wa bihamdi subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilaik. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.